that I published uh, last week, actually. So here, is the, here are the highlights. This is what you're going to get out of the book. Um, so I, I, it's very actually challenging to find a, a, a couple of sentences that characterize what I did here. But uh, the, the coffee world is a very complicated one. It's a very uh, uh, you know, universal one. And so this book will sort of give you a view of what's going on in the coffee world today um, in a way that might uh, surprise you. Um, there are a lot of, so it's, it's very easy to digest. Okay, there are a lot of photos. Chapters are like four to six pages. You can sit down for 10 minutes, learn something interesting about a particular region of the world. Given that I'm a database guy, there are a bunch of data uh, visualizations, infographics, stuff like that. Um, I, I, you know, I eat my own dog food. Um, and, and one of the big features that you're going to see there is that there is a this subculture of, of baristas, uh, highfalutin, uh, world-pushing or, or, or envelope-pushing uh, baristas that are really advancing the coffee world in, in ways that are uh, quite impressive. And so you're going to see a lot of that. Um, you're going to see that the, what you thought are the uh, hotbeds of coffee are not the hotbeds of coffee anymore. Um, and, and you'll see a lot of the, uh, the new hotbeds, uh, where they are, what's going on in the book. Um, and I, I try to meet with a lot of the people that are actually driving innovation in the coffee world, um, and you'll see their stories. Uh, given that you're going to spend so much time in, in cocktail parties, uh, so this will, book will give you a bunch of uh, good stories to share and, and you know, get a crowd around you in a, in a cocktail party. Um, and you, you know, coffee is a uh, there's a lot of history in coffee, and there are books that you know you, you can. They're, they're so thick you can actually kill with them uh, about co about coffee history. What I tried to do was distill it to you know the, the absolute necessary, hopefully in a in a in a reasonably um, engaging fashion. Uh, so you'll get the the idea of coffee history. Now, when you talk about coffee history, you have to remember one thing: there is no such thing as coffee history, really. It's coffee legend with some analysis that people think is history. So whenever you talk about coffee history, um, you know, feel free to make up your own stories. If you tell them to have people, they might, uh, you know, they might stick. So here's what I'm going to do today. Uh, as, like, I'm a Googler, just like all of us. Uh, I'm going to tell you why I did this. OK, I'm still trying to figure that out. I'll tell you uh, what I did. Uh, and some of the lessons learned. OK, and this, this is not a, uh, a sequence. This is a. Um, they're all going to be intermixed, okay? And I'm taking questions. Um, anybody who has uh, any questions about coffee or uh, all of this process, um, I, uh, let's, let's make this interactive. So it all started um, in Café del Doge. This is a cafe in, in on University Avenue in, um, in Palo Alto. It's been renamed to Café Venetia uh, a few months ago. And I used to go there every Sunday with my, my son and ask for a cappuccino, okay? And after a, a, a while, I realized that there's too much milk in their cappuccinos. But it's an Italian cafe, and you don't complain in an Italian cafe unless you can do it in Italian, right? So it took me about six months until I, I worked up enough courage to say, you know, your cappuccinos have a little, you know, too much milk. Give me something different. So they said, try the macchiatone. Okay, this is. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a Venetian uh, uh, specialty. It's basically, think of it as in, in the middle between a, a ma macchiato and a cappuccino. So a, a, macchi a macchiato with, more, with a little bit more milk. So it's the perfect combination of milk and espresso. Okay? Um, and it's, it's called different things in different places in the world, actually. So, so, pe so several people have, have honed in on this concept. So I, I had this drink. It was... It was great. It was perfect. I, I went and I, I blogged about it that day. Remember the days when people used to express themselves in more than 140 characters? So I, I, I wrote a blog about the Marquetone, hoping to uh, share my excitement with the world. And, and then I started walking, you know, traveling around the world uh, from, for work and explaining to people that, about the Marquetone and realizing that nobody knows about the Marquetone, not even the coffee professionals of the world. And so a couple of weeks later, I did a search on Macchiatone, hoping <laughs> our good search engine can help. <laughs> and I came up with, I think this is still true today, okay? Um, uh, so if, this is like an unknown concept. It, take, you know, it took me to, to, uh, to teach Google, and, and, and I checked on competition as well. And, and Bing has you know, six, of the top, um, six of the top 10 results on Bing are, are me. Market when, when you heard from market on it. Some of them made, made it to the, uh, the, the ACM website, 
they, th there was a period where the ACM website was copying a bunch of blog posts from any computer scientist who cared to blog. So all of a sudden, Macchiatone and ACM came up. <laughs> Pretty weird. So I realized I was on to something. Okay? Not, not a lot of people know about this. And, um, and I wanted to discover why is it that in only very special places of, in the world, um, you, you can find the Macchiatone. Okay, so I, in fact, the, what, what happens is the Macchiatone is known in a very narrow strip of Italy between Venice and uh, Verona. If you go outside of those boundaries, you are, you're not, nobody's going to know what you're talking about. Okay, so I even had an Italian colleague from uh, the University of Washington. I sent him, well, I didn't send him, he was in Naples. I told him to go ask for a Macchiatone in Naples. The guy, you know, he was thrown out of the cafe telling him, this is an American invention, we don't know about this here. <laughs> So, uh, so that was a curiosity. Um, so, still going back to why I did this. At the time I started, we were running, uh, we were starting Google Fusion tables. So, uh, we were still running Google Fusion tables. So I needed a personal application domain where I could uh, really beat on my team uh, on a regular basis. This is uh, a beautiful map that you can create in 30 seconds with Fusion tables that shows where coffee is, is uh, uh, is produced in the world. So I think this actually the, the coffee tables that we created, the fusion tables, are one of the most accessed tables because we put them in some of our examples and and um, and, uh, and they've become very uh, useful for people who are trying out fusion tables. Um, and uh, you know, you would think when I when we started, you know, when you did a search on on, on fusion tables for coffee. You know, two tables came up, my, my two tables. Today when you do a search, you have hundreds of tables coming up, so it's a sign of something. Yeah? yeah. Uh, that looks like the Northern Territory of Canada has coffee yeah. <laughs> That is true. See, that's, that's what I mean. I needed a personal example to... to Organizer uh, entry? Yes. Yeah. National Park. Oh, National Park, yes. In a few years, actually, this is one of the things that I learned in, in my work. In a few years, you're probably going to be growing coffee in Canada. Okay, the places in the world where you can grow coffee are, are changing. Um, but we'll get to the sad part later. This is, by the way, where coffee is consumed in the world. Uh, very different. Uh, you'll see that the uh, Scandinavians uh, lead the way um, in, the, in the coffee consumption. Um, and of course, coming from uh, the most advanced coffee culture in a tech company, uh, I had a really good home base uh, to start from. So, you know, the coffee we have here at Google is of the best in the world. Okay, I can now tell you this after going through a lot of suffering and a lot of, uh, of time on airplanes. Uh, this was, to me, very inspiring, the nine o'clock uh, get together of a bunch of folks. Um, now this, this moved to building 47, right? That's right. You took the machine with you. You ruined the entire culture. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, to me, actually, you know, I, I got a lot of work done at Google just hanging out around the espresso machine, okay, uh, trying to catch certain senior executives to get two minutes of their time. So uh, you published this in your book, and people can now copy Sanjay and Luis's badges and get inner access. To yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. I did even worse than that. Yeah. I did. I even did a, an analysis of the Google query log using uh, insights to search. Where is your seat? So using a publicly facing tool, and I try to understand what people are searching for when they're looking for, for coffee. So there's actually a chapter in the book about Google. Okay, this is uh, one of the things that makes this book stand apart from any other coffee book. <laughs> or Stephen Levy's book, for that matter. You can talk about uh, coffee. Um, I also discovered during, my, uh, uh, during working on this book that I'm uniquely qualified to do this, because in my team, I have uh, a grandson of a Colombian coffee farmer who may decide to reveal himself who may not. Uh, a, a son of somebody who worked for Hills Brothers, one of the big American coffee companies, which now explains why he only drinks tea. And uh, a former owner, uh, a former owner of a cafe in Seoul, Korea. Okay, so th these are three people in a relatively small team. Um, uh, I feel, you know, I discovered this as I was doing this work. Okay, so I started, uh, so with all this reason to do this, I started doing my, uh, my coffee search. I actually really wanted to use this as a title of my book, but people told me not to. I don't know why. <laughs> so remember, when you, when you come up with a, a title for a book, coming up with a good title for a book is like the hardest thing to do. Um, what I did was I delegated it to my wife, and she came up with, uh, with the title that you're seeing here. So I made a plan. Um, I was going to hit all these places 
uh, to, to, um, to try to understand how coffee and culture play off each other in the world, okay? So some of these trips were um, part of my other, my actual day job, okay? Places where I gave talks or attended conferences, and some, maybe not, okay? I had to, I, uh, I, you know, I took time off and visited them. Um, so very quickly I discovered this thing that, that really uh, um, captured my, my imagination. So actually I heard about this from Emily Roth, who was a, a, a Googler, and her ex-boyfriend is actually a well-known guy in the coffee world. So there are competitions, there are competitions uh, between baristas um, to, for, for what's called the World Barista Championship. So this guy is uh, Mike Phillips, he's actually uh, an American. Um, and uh, what they do is they spend, uh, you, you might wonder, what is the World Barista Channel? What, what do they do? So they, they have a 15 minute show, you can see these things on, on, uh, uh, on the web, where they have to create four espressos, four cappuccinos, and four what they call signature drinks. Okay, and there's a, a score sheet that, you know, uh, would make, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty detailed. Um, and uh, it would make the, the uh, in terms of, of service that we publish to our users look <laughs> short and sweet. But so, so they're, they're judged on the quality, on the, on the taste, on the balance, on the story, on the crema, on all kinds of things. And uh, they're about Suspenders? 50. What? Suspenders? Uh, suspenders, yes. And sometimes they actually use, they, they, they accentuate their show with, uh, with, with clothing, with the music that they have. And it, it's become a complete... Uh, um, these guys are really showsmen. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. And um, there are people from 50, over 50 countries that, that compete in this. There are national championships, and then they have to go to the world treasure of, of uh, going to the one in London last year. Um, they have other kinds of competitions, so um, latte art championship. Um, yeah, this one is a, is a better one. Uh, so <coughs> this year I went to um, SIGMOD, the, the big database conference. Uh, you know, I, I, I do databases, and I've become a very useful guy to know. So we, this, this conference was in Athens, and there's one really, really good cafe in Athens. So I took people from Sigmod to, to this wonderful cafe, because there was the, the, the five-time Greek barista champion is, is from this cafe, and, and it really sources the best beans in the world. And we go there, and the guy says, you know, uh, Stefanos will be here soon, but I'm the latte art champion of Greece. <laughs> like, okay, you're gonna make coffee. And so he was making coffee for all the Sigma people who, who uh, were really enjoying this experience. This is one of his creations. And the reason he was so happy to, to do this was because the week after uh, was the World Latte Art Championship. Okay, so he was practicing. I brought him a bunch of, of uh, uh, guinea pigs to, to practice his latte art on. And so Sigma finished, and all the Sigma people went home. I went to the World Latte Art Championship because you know <laughs> I, I'm dedicated to the project. And what do you know? This Greek guy won the World Championship. So I'm like, hey, dude, I was, I made this happen. <laughs> I got a, a, a big Greek hug after the, the thing, and, and uh, I really felt this was sort of the putting my Sigma and, and coffee personalities together. Uh, it was a great moment. Um, I, this is the 2007 World Barista Champion. This is the first World Barista Champion to ever make coffee for me. I went to, he's from London. Uh, I went to visit him at his grocery and he said, do you want me to make you coffee? He's like, what do you think? I came out of London to, to, to coffee. So actually, this is a good, um, uh, some of you know the answer, but um, how, which country do you think won the most World Barista Championships since it started in 2000? So there have been 11 of them so far. Scotland. Scotland. USA. Canada. Italy. <laughs> Somebody said Italy. Right? Wrong. The Italians never made it to the top ten. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you guys are too full of yourselves. <laughs> like, you know everything. Buy <laughs> <laughs> the book first, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so none of you got the answer, not even the people who know the answer, because uh, I've told them. It's Denmark. Okay, Denmark, and after that, Norway and the UK. Actually, this guy was uh, the first um, English dude to, to win it. And uh, the US won for the first time, Mike Phillips. This guy won in 2010. So, um, so the hotbeds of, of coffee are, are moving, moving away. This is one of the nice things about the coffee world. You can walk up to the World Barista Champion uh, like two hours after you won the championship and, 
and, uh, and get a picture. Uh, this is Mike Phillips, this guy is Gianni. He's a very special guy in the coffee world. He just goes around knowing all the baristas and, and um, there's actually a section about him in the book as well. Is it time? Uh, he is Italian. He is, uh, he is the main contribution of Italy uh, to the World Barista Championship. Not only that, okay, the machines that they use in the World Barista Championship are either Italian or Italian. Okay, they 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 compete between La Marzocco and Nuova Simonelli. Okay, so there you go. And coffee is grown in Italy. I forgot. No, okay. <laughs> people think coffee is grown in Italy. You'd be surprised how how many people uh, think. Like that. Tomatoes don't come from there either. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, this is a guy practicing for the World Barista Championship 2020. Uh, this is my little boy. Uh, he's become so. This this project affected my family in, in more than one way. Uh, he just, he realized very so. So he's six years old now. He was five when he did this. He realized that in order to bond with his dad, he needs to <laughs> learn how to dance. Uh, good espresso, and he's. Um, how many coffees per day does he have? <laughs> he can make quite a few, but he doesn't like the stuff. He'll, he'll have a, a nice foam milk. Uh, so far, I don't know. But, uh, so yeah, so he's, he's a great espresso maker. Um, there's another kind of competition, which is on the growing side. Okay, and uh, this is actually in Brazil. Um, so what they do there is, these are farmers, they submit samples of their coffee, and there is a jury that comes and judges uh, judges these coffees, they give them scores. There's a national jury. So for example, in Brazil, there were 250 farmers who entered. The national jury um, uh, uh, narrowed it down to 50, uh, 50 samples. And then came the international jury, okay? So I schnoozled my way onto the international jury of, uh, uh, in Brazil last year. And what, we, what you do here is um, you get eight coffees, eight or 10 coffees every round. And you start by, by um, let's see, well, that's me doing my thing. But uh, you start by smell. There's a lot of smelling going on, okay? So you start by smelling it uh, when it's just ground, okay? It's really interesting. And then you, uh, you pour water into it, and you wait four minutes, and you start smelling it again. And then you, you remove the crema from the top, in which, at, at which point the, all the aromas explode in, uh, in a very, very nice way. And then you start tasting, and you go around the table, and you taste, and you taste for about 45 minutes, and the, the coffees actually change their, their tastes during this time, and, and some of them lose their structure, if I learned this term, you know, from listening to the coffee people. And then after these, after these 45 minutes, you fill, you, know, you fill out a form, you give a score, you go into another room and you have a discussion, just like a program committee discussion in, in, a, in a conference, okay? And people start throwing a, you know, all kinds of words, like the, the flavors of the coffee, and, and you know, they throw out all kinds of flavors that, that was coffee, that was not, you know, um, what you guys just said. And then they start talking about the acidity. And this, the acidity is really the, the spirit of the coffee. And acidity can come in all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of, of ways. And then you go back and you do another eight coffees, another eight coffees, another, and you do this all day. And it's kind of fun, actually. Um, and so you, you slurp and you, you, it's just like wine, you, you, you spit most of it out. Um, and this is, this is the deliberations of the jury. And then at the end of the week, we, you know, we went through round one, two, and three, and, and we, uh, we gave an award to, uh, to this very lucky person. Okay, so the, the interesting thing about this is that the coffees that get the Cup of Excellence stamp on them, they participate in an internet auction. So roasters from uh, all around the world can bid for these things, and this guy, uh, for example, sold his lot for uh, something like $25 a pound. Compare this to three that he would get on the market uh, for, you know, that's the, 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 the running price, okay? So these guys really, now he's not selling his whole, uh, you know, crop for, for this, but again, it's, it's more the, the glory, the, I mean, this guy is one out of 350,000 farmers in Brazil who, you know, he's cup of excellence, okay? Um, it, it helps the, that's the other interesting thing here, it creates direct relationships between farmers and import, and roasters and importers. So before this, what happened is all the farmers in Brazil take their farm, their, their coffees, and they put it into four big bins. And what you get is you get four choices of coffee from Brazil, whereas you have, you know, in any country that grows coffee, you have hundreds of, of really interesting uh, uh, different flavors of coffee. So now they can work directly with 
people with the roasters, the roasters can come and invest in a particular farm and work with them over, over multiple years and really create a relationship. And it, that completely changes the dynamics of the coffee world. Okay? And this happened in the last 10 years. Okay? You know, we always think that as tech people, we're like advancing the world at, at speeds that nobody can, cover, can catch up. But this, the changes in the coffee world in the last 15 years have been um, mind-boggling. I, 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 I went, this is in Costa Rica. So this is, uh, okay, this is how coffee comes, okay? This is, the, this is where coffee comes from. These cherries, which you can actually uh, uh, chew on, and in fact, people for many years only chewed on them before they realized, oh, that there's something good in here that we can roast and, and put in our lattes. Um, uh, this is what, uh, what they come from, okay? So it's, it's, it's a very colorful uh, activity, if you like. So I tried to cover, uh, I tried to follow coffee history a little bit. I went to Ethiopia, so those of you who know, Yirgacheff is a, is a region that is known for its, its very uh, wonderful coffees. You can see Yirgacheff, I went to the Yirgacheff, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, this was a, a really interesting experience. After the, um, from Ethiopia, coffee moved on to the uh, Arabian Peninsula, to the Ottoman Empire. I tried to go to the Ottoman Empire. Turns out it's too late. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, I, I went pretty close. Uh, this is the old city in, in Jerusalem where you go there and you think you're in the, in the uh, Ottoman Empire. Actually, it's kind of interesting. So the, 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 the story of how coffee came to the world is, you know, is kind of uh, vague. Okay, so the, 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 um, the legend that everybody knows about is Haldi the goat herder who saw his goats prancing, and he said, oh, why are they dancing? Maybe I should, they were eating some red cherries, and he said, I'll, I'll have some of that. Okay, and actually, he, he said, let me wait a day, let me, let me wait a day, see what happens to my goats, and if they're still alive tomorrow, I'll, I'll also have some of that. Okay, but actually, uh, uh, the, the, what turns out is the, what, what is the leading uh, theory today, is that uh, discovering coffee was actually due to the Chinese which is kind of not what you would expect. What happened was, in the 15th century, there were a bunch of fleet, uh, uh, very big ships that came from China uh, to Yemen. Okay, they were looking for all kinds of great things from Africa. They were bringing giraffes back for the emperor and stuff like that. And so they were like really like 200 ship fleets. And they came there to Yemen and they brought their tea with them. And, and uh, the, the Arabs saw that you can actually put a leaf in hot water and get something good out of it. And very abruptly, they, the Chinese stopped, um, stopped sending, they decided one day to stop this fleet. And the Arabs were like, hey, where's our tea? Okay, we need this tea. So they started looking around. It's like, where, where, are, we going to find, um, where are we going to find some tea? So they, they walked over, not walked over, they, they went over the, the uh, in the Red Sea, there's a, a very narrow passage from Yemen to Ethiopia. And they started looking around and they found the leaves of the coffee tree in, uh, in Ethiopia. And after a while, they, they realized there's something actually better here. There's the, uh, there's the bean, and you can roast it. That took another 100 years. But, um, but that's, again, the leading theory for how coffee actually became uh, something that we drink today. And uh, in Ethiopia, you know, 3,000 years ago, people were, were chewing the bean. They were actually making little golf ball-sized uh, snacks out of it before they went out to war. And they, uh, that is how they consumed coffee. So um, I also, uh, uh, you know, in my dedication to the project, I um, I paid a lot of money for coffee. Uh, so until 2009, my my um, seven dollars was the most I paid for a cup of coffee. I broke that record um, <laughs> twice, sixty-five dollars. But the vast majority of that is the parking tickets. Um, it was, you know, I did this in LA and. Uh, San Francisco. So the problem was I parked before I had the coffee. Um, but the real record was in Japan, uh, where I paid $140 for a cup of coffee. And the reason was I was visiting the barista champion of Japan, and she told me, well, yeah, we're just really close to Tokyo. Why don't you come out and visit our cafe? And I, it turns out really close to Tokyo. It was like a two-hour train ride from, uh, from Tokyo, which cost me 140 bucks. But when I got there, I got a free espresso. <laughs> but it was really good from uh, Bolivia. And these, the, the Japanese are actually one of the best. Uh, the Japanese and the Norwegians are the two uh, cultures that are really pushing coffee to to uh, to their extremes. And it's kind of I mean, in Norway is because people have money, so they can pay more for coffee. In Japan, it's because people are used to paying more for good stuff. It's part of the culture. Um, I got a life. 
So now on Facebook, uh, when I see somebody having you know 80 or so mutual friends with me, it's guaranteed to be a coffee person. Um, I my one of my celebrated days was when the Specialty Coffee Association of America decided to follow me on Twitter. <laughs> it's pretty cool, you know. Two weeks later, the European Specialty Coffee Association decided to follow me on Twitter. Um, you know, there are a bunch of cafes in San Francisco that follow me on Twitter. It's it's kind of cool. Um, I don't actually tweet that much, but it's, <laughs> that, apparently that doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, so then I went to a bunch of exotic places. So on the plane to London, to the World Barista Championship, I saw this photo. And this is a, a, an Icelandic family. So this woman, Amy Bjork, um, is the, she was the uh, uh, Iceland, Icelandic Barista Championship <coughs> champion in 2010. Her brother, Tumi, was the coffee tasting champion of Iceland. Their f I'll tell you about that competition in a moment. Now their father, uh, you know, there aren't that many jobs in Iceland today. So their father, uh, he's a minister by training, he, he's a tourist guide, he teaches at, at elementary schools, and he teaches Web 2.0 at the University of Iceland. And I, I made the mistake about, of telling him about fusion tables, and two days later he sends me an email saying, oh, you have a bug here and a bug there. <laughs> Don't bug me with your bugs, but we fixed them all. So anyway, so this, so he was looking for something to do because his children were winning awards in coffee, and he had a lot of time on his hands. So there's a competition called uh, Coffee in Good Spirits, where you create uh, interesting drinks with alcohol and coffee. Okay, and this is one of the big competitions that goes on every year. And he uh, he entered the competition, and what do you know? He won the Icelandic. Coffee in Good Spirits Championship, beating out all five other people. <laughs> the, uh, so these guys were pretty, pretty upset because now their dad was coming on their on their glory trip to to, um, uh, to London for the World Barista Championship, but apparently he behaved well. So I met them in London and I said, you know, you guys are great. I need to write it. You know, it's a great story. I need to write about you guys. So they said, well, why don't you come to Reykjavik? And I was like, yeah, why not? So I, I hopped on a plane and went to uh, Reykjavik. And, uh, and so they, they uh, I need to explain, this is their summer house. <laughs> so they hosted me for dinner at their summer house. Now, to, to understand, this is in, outside the city of Selfoss. Selfoss is a city about one hour away from Reykjavik. It's known mostly for, to, for being the burial place of, uh, of Bobby Fischer, the, the chess player. And, but this is, you know, you, you go out of, your, out of uh, Selfoss and you, and, and you show them, you see that house over there? That's, that's where we're going, okay? So I'm sitting there with a family of, you know, you know six, that they were, each one brought their girlfriend or spouse or whatever. And here I am sitting in basically the tip of the world with all these people discussing the right balance between coffee and alcohol in an Irish coffee. Okay, and this was one of the more uh, interesting moments of this, uh, of this trip, of this whole experience. And this is uh, Carlos making, these are, these were fantastic. Okay, notice that what you get judged on the separation here, so this line here has to be very clean, okay? These Irish coffees are just like totally sublime, okay? Um, I, I wish I could make uh, anything that, that looks like that. Um, this is another, this is a store owner, in a uh, bookstore owner in Selfoss. He was, uh, so uh, Carlos took me here on his way to the summer house. This guy used to be a member of parliament of Iceland until one day he, um, he responded to an email saying exactly what he thinks about his party members. He, he didn't realize that he was CCing the entire party. <laughs> Two days later he was uh, an owner of a bookstore. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, politics are pretty, pretty rough. Yeah. So, uh, this is another very different experience, uh, Sarajevo. Okay, so I actually, when, when I was sitting in Ritual Coffee in San Francisco one day, and I told a guy sitting next to me, heard that I'm writing a book about world coffee culture, and he said, you have to go to Bosnia. I'm like, dude, I'm not going to Bosnia right now, okay? <laughs> So I, but I remember the comment, and then when I was uh, in Vienna, one, uh, I was sitting in one of the grand cafes of Vienna, and the waiter comes up to me and says, you know, you're writing a coffee book, I have a story for you. I'm not sure it's a very good story, but what the heck, that's free. He says, one day I was sitting in Bosnia and Sarajevo in a cafe. I had coffee, I got up, I wanted to, to leave the cafe and pay and, and leave. And I go to the waiter and he, say, he tells me, mister, 
I will pay for your coffee, but never come back to this cafe again. <laughs> I'm like, what did that? I, pay, I drank, I paid, what else? <laughs> what am I supposed to do here? It's like, in Sarajevo, we don't just drink our coffee and go. We sit here for hours. <laughs> if you leave now, you're insulting me. Okay? So once I heard that story, I said, okay, I need to go to Bosnia. <laughs> and so I started uh, through my social network. I found people in Bosnia that actually hosted me uh, very nicely. And apparently the, the, the culture in Bosnia, the coffee culture in Bosnia is, is probably the deepest um, I've seen anywhere in the world. Okay, maybe you know, close to uh, Ethiopia. But the, really, everything around there is... Um, is about, co I mean, a lot of social interactions are deeply ingrained around coffee, okay? And that led to one of my finest moments. After publishing uh, many Sigma papers, I was invited to publish a paper in Barista Magazine. <laughs> that was really, uh, and, and they heard that I was going to Bosnia, nobody, and the coffee in Bosnia is not very good, okay? So the coffee, the people, the coffee people are not going there. But I published a paper about my trip to uh, Bosnia in Barista Magazine. It was one of my finest, finest, and proudest moments. Um, I also went to some of the classical, where's the Italian in the crowd? Uh, one, of, one of the classical uh, locations, this is a nice one. If, if you're interested in chocolate and coffee coming together, go to Torino. Okay, they have invented 200 years ago the drink called the Bicerin, which is a combination of chocolate, espresso, and uh, milk. It's wonderful. Everywhere you go in Torino, people will give you, or that's that's the main thing on the menu. Bicerin, this bicerin, that bicerin. <coughs> my wife enjoying um, uh, the bicerin. This is in the cafe that that the, the original bicerin cafe in, in Torino. Okay, so it's a very different kind of experience. So I, I also went to some of the more classical places in Europe. And you know, the one thing about coffee is people ask me where is the best coffee in the world and you know uh, stuff like that. Coffee is really a combination of the quality of the coffee. And the, and the experience, who are you having the coffee with, okay? And, um, uh, and there are places in the world that are based on emphasizing the experience. So the entire city of Paris is based on the fact that the experience is enough and the coffee can be really, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to point that out. Um, there are a few other cities that I will not mention, but Italy's fine. It'll, I really do enjoy the coffee. <laughs> Usually if I'm close enough, I will drive into Italy just to have coffee. I'll buy another book. Okay. <laughs> I, and I went to Italy three times. I went to. <laughs> and, and Peter, uh, I want to thank Peter Norvig here, who, who made the mistake of telling me he was going to Italy, and 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 came back with some great photos that are in the book about uh, of, of cafes in in uh, in Venice. Okay, there are a few people who contributed uh, photos to the book, so I want to thank them all. Um, one of my big surprises in, is uh, was Australia. Uh, go to Melbourne. Melbourne is, if I had to retire and just spend my time going between cafe and cafe, I would now move to Melbourne. Okay, there is no other place in the world that is such a uh, sorry New Zealand. New Zealand has a fine, fine coffee culture. And, and in fact, it was one of the countries that inspired me to write this book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but, but sorry, Australia is... Um, this guy created uh, on his own. He created this uh, espresso machine that has six group heads, okay? So and he's got six grinders to go with it. So he doesn't want to mix up grinds and, and group heads. He has a grinder for every group head. The guy is a is a, is a real hacker when it comes to uh, coffee machines. His uh, Proud Mary uh, Cafe in Melbourne, Sydney is pretty good too. Okay, so everywhere in in, um, uh, in Australia is actually pretty good. So there, there are two countries two kinds of countries in the world, right? Those who were sort of born before coffee, and so they, 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 the evolution of, of the culture and coffee there took place, um, and, and coffee is very, in varying in quality. And then there are countries that were just sort of, you know, coffee came after it was already at a certain level. So for example, Australia, a bunch of Italians moved there in, in the 1950s, and, and, and uh, you know, they, they jump-started a really good coffee culture already. Um, yes. Uh, I had to do this too. In Cambodia, I had the worst cup of coffee possible. Um, but then I noticed that in the hotel menu, they had a coffee body rub. So what you're seeing here is a bunch of ground coffee, which I, I swear I, I it was the same as they, they served in the pub. <laughs> this, was, um, uh, this was oil. So they spend an hour just rubbing coffee grounds into you. 
uh, which, you know, uh, was actually pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I once, smelling like a tall latte for two days. <laughs> um, I would do it again. In fact, I did it in, in Costa Rica after that. Um, the United States of America. Okay, so this is one of the, the, you know, I have a section in the book about the United States. It's a sad uh, story for the first 200 years. Um, fortunately, due to Alfred Peet, uh, this is his first door in, in Berkeley. Uh, he turned things around. Um, he, uh, um, you know, he showed people that coffee is actually an art and, and should not be judged by the level of the commercial on TV. And, the, uh, and, and basically, all the, all the great coffee we know about today is the inspiration of, uh, of Alfred Peake. That's not to say that the roast, you know, Alfred Peake actually had a, a relatively dark roast, and he actually trained the Starbucks guys how to, how to roast and burn coffee. But the, but the idea that, that, that there's so much going into coffee came from Alfred Peake, and then a whole bunch of other people um, made it into, into what, uh, what it is today. Okay, so today you can go to places like Four Barrel, or you can just hang out here at Google and have four barrels of coffee, and, uh, and you're really getting some of the best uh, coffee in the world. How did I approach the coffee world? Um, you know, how do I, I didn't know anybody in the coffee world when I started, I had to like get my way in, so of course there's the infinite charm of, of a database expert trying to help you with your data needs, right? <laughs> so I try, you know, I approach people with, uh, with fusion tables and saying, hey, I can map your data and, and show you all kinds of things, and sometimes that worked, but when that didn't work, there's always swag. So I, I, you know, I traveled around the world giving people um, uh, various Google swag items, and that really opened any door I wanted. Uh, this is my host in Bosnia. Um, I gave her more than a hat, but she was so happy, and, and then she had a birthday a little later that um, her mom made her a Google cake with a Google hat, and, and you can see happiness. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so if you see, so there are a lot of coffee people going around meeting at highfalutin coffee conferences comparing their, their Google swag now, and that, that's, that's um, your fault. Uh, <laughs> credit for it. Uh, this is it. The, the only thing to notice here is this is the only coffee book ever written that has a quote from Vint Cerf. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and uh, I don't know if you can read it, but, um, but it, it is really well said. Um, and then there's the World Barista Champion and, and the Editor-in-Chief of Barista Magazine. So... There's no Italian. No Italian. Oh. <laughs> but there's, there's a chapter about Italy. I, I say really nice things about Italy. Isn't so, Vent really Italian? Huh? Isn't Vent an Italian name somehow? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe it is. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't sound like it. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. That's uh, I'll take any any you know the the one lesson that I wanted to convey is the coffee world is moving really really fast. Coffee is is really from the moment you take these chairs off the tree until you get them in the cup. The process is really difficult. It's being really pushed forward by a network of people all over the world. And it's just it was really amazing to 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 be part of that community and and, and see how things are changing. So I really appreciate the coffee that you have here at Google. Um, great, great book, and good talk, and I think you should be on the Discovery Channel and have a real show. Um, I have a question. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, Mom made us instant coffee, and we loved it. And now I hear in parts of the world, instant coffee is coming back into style. Did you run across that anywhere? No. <laughs> so I grew up on instant coffee, and, and, and I liked it, and when I was in doing my military service, you know, having a cup of instant coffee was, was actually something that I would spend an entire hour crafting and, and putting together. Um, no. I mean, th there's a return of drip coffee. So where people pour, you know, uh, non-espresso type uh, preparations of coffee, and, and that's um, certainly making a comeback. But I have not heard instant coffee make a comeback. How about Vienna? And when I went there, it was a while ago, I was shocked. And the fact that just side by side with the soccer cafe, there is the Starbucks. Yes. What happened? Uh, so, so there's a chapter about Starbucks in the book, and I try to be nice just in case they, you know, they come to me and say that they want to sell the books in <laughs> Starbucks. But no, I think I think Starbucks should be credited with really taking espresso worldwide and showing that there is potential here. Okay, and a lot of the what I, you know, what people call the third wave coffee, which is 
think of Starbucks as being second wave. Think of instant coffee as being first wave. But, um, so a lot of the third wave coffee people are, 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 are here because Starbucks sort of you know, upped the ante and, and made it very universal. So, so now you see much better coffee coming up you know, right next to Starbucks. So why do you think that Vienna needs a Starbucks? I don't think Vienna needs a Starbucks. I think <laughs> Viennese probably realized that Vienna. <laughs> you know, the best coffee I had in Vienna was the, the, the Nespresso shop. You know, where they have these very colorful uh, uh, displays of all their little capsules with different colors. You go in there and you tell them you're writing a book and so they'll give you a free espresso. That was the best coffee I had. So the coffee itself in the Vienna was not, was not great. Uh, so I'm from, from Oslo, Illinois, and uh, we used to use a lot of Carabras coffee. Uh -huh. uh, like when you first found yourself, it's spreading around the world already. Yeah, so the, I mean, a few years ago, I don't think it even existed. Um, certainly, yes, uh, AeroPress is one of the uh, great ways to, um, to have really high quality coffee, especially if you're traveling and you want really good coffee. Um, you'll see that, in fact, there is an AeroPress World Championship uh, with the, uh, and congratulations on coming from Oslo. I had, you know, the best roaster in the world is, is from Oslo. In fact, the first world barista champion is from Oslo. Yeah. Have you had coffee luwak? What do you think? And what do you think? <laughs> so the most frequent question I get was when I wrote, when, as I was writing this book, is, did you hear about that cat that uh, and, you know you eat, you know, or the monkey that has the thing? So Pete, there, you know, there's a lot of misinformation about it. Yes. So it's called coffee luwak. There's a, a civet cat. It goes around. What's, what's interesting about the civet cat is it actually goes in the fields and knows how to choose the right cherries. Okay. And then it digests the, it, it eats the cherries and comes out from the other side and you know, hopefully then cleans very thoroughly. <laughs> and um, and, it, and uh, it's, it's, it's um, I didn't like it. I, I, I had it, there's a section in the book about it. Um, the, what happened, what, what's happening is that people realize that they can make a lot of money doing this. So now instead of having civet cats run wild in the fields, uh, uh, choosing the cherries, they put them in cages and they start feeding them cherries, and they, you know, they charge the same the same prices. So it's one of those um, poster child gimmick coffees that, that you see all over the world. Uh, there's a great quote from George Howell, who's the, you know, one of the big names in coffee in the U.S. I'm not sure I can. Well, I'm among friends. He says, "Coffee to work is coffee." From assholes for assholes. <laughs> just, just a messenger. Yeah. Um, when you had that competition in Brazil, where you were tasting all the beans, how did you normalize for all the different ways to roast? Oh, they they roast it. Uh, they they all roast together. So it's it's a very uniform roast. And, but you could argue that that doesn't actually bring out the, the expression of every coffee. So actually, every coffee could be brought out with a, a slightly different roast, and, but that, that would be lost. What is a tasting competition? Huh? Tasting competition. The taste? Tasting competition. What does it take oh, to oh, be that's, a um, champion? So what they do is, uh, it's really interesting, what they do is they give you a uh, triangulation test. So they give you three cups of coffee, and they um, and two of them are identical and one is different. Okay, so the trick is to guess which one is different. And so you have eight sets of three, and the person who guesses the most is the winner. And if there's a tie, then time and time matters. And in fact, the Ritual Coffee here uh, has like the three-time U.S. Uh, champion uh, Ben Kaminsky. Um, and actually, this year it was really uh, interesting because there was this Greek guy, okay, who said, you know. I'm not going to taste, I'm just going to look. Okay, so he looked at the coffee and he, you know, said, oh, that's a different, different, different. <laughs> And this was very amusing in the first round and even very amusing in the second round. But then the world, he won the world championship. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so I was talking to the guy who invented the competition right after that, and he said, well, we're changing the rules next year. And so what they're going to have is um, uh, they're going to, um, first of all, the, the cups are not going to be white, so they're, they're going to be yeah. black, so you can't actually 
see that much, and they're not going to have as much lighting on the. Uh, and the thing is, when he when he, uh, when he looked, he could actually um, do it faster. So he actually won on, on time against a, a guy who actually uh, tasted the coffee. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting competition. It's really hard. I mean, even the winners, like the winner of the world championship, uh, got four uh, four out of eight correct. So it's like if they get five or six, it's like. Whoa. Really hard. I gotta ask, do you cover the Caribbean? Do I cover the Caribbean? No, I don't. I, I cover Central. I'm sorry. So let me let me start with apologies. Okay. <laughs> I apologize to the nation of India. Okay. I, I have many Indian friends, and I uh, I would like to go to India to have an interesting coffee culture. Second edition. I apologize to the country of Canada who's got a great coffee culture, but I just didn't find a great story to tell about Canada. So I didn't want to just go around saying, oh, here are a bunch of cafes in Toronto or Vancouver. I wanted a real, uh, really interesting story. I apologized to New Zealand. Uh, I do not apologize to Italy. I think I gave you <laughs> all, the, all the respect you deserve. Um, and the entire you know, Indonesia, um, you know, that, that whole region, I, I just did not go to. Them. I have a day job. So. <laughs> So there are probably a few other apologies, but. Uh. So I, I was reading about Brazilian coffee, and I, apparently historically it was pretty not great quality. But it sounds both like you're optimistic and it seems to be coming up in quality over the past couple of years. But one of the stories I heard, and I want to know if you know about it, is um, that because of the processing practices of the past, there is an unusual taste or flavor associated with Brazilian coffee. Is that still true? We have a Brazilian in the room who can <laughs> comment. Uh, uh, Luis? I have a feeling you probably know more about Brazilian coffee <laughs> than I do at this point. Uh, okay. Yeah, Brazilian coffee, uh, it's never been very good until the last 10 years. And then the phenomenon Alan just mentioned in that you know, local producers began sort of getting direct access to markets and getting incentives for better quality. Yeah. The majority of the coffee still grown in Brazil is crap. But there's a few ones that are really, really fantastic. Yeah, no, I, I can believe that. That's why I was curious about the change over time. Because yeah. at one time, I know the practice in Brazil was basically strip the tree rather than pick cherries. Yeah, I, mean, I grew up in the coffee farm, and we made very bad coffee. <laughs> 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 but I don't know that there's a signature taste from Brazil. No, so, so yeah, Brazil is so, so much big. stuff. So big. Yeah, yeah. And if you go from the north of Brazil to the south, the weather variations are just so crazy. Uh, yeah. Just no, the, the story I remember hearing was that because uh, uh, there's so much, you know, difficulty in processing coffee, you would, a lot of it would mold, and so that taste of the mold in the coffee became a distinctive signature flavor. And I was curious, you know, civet caps is one thing, B. <laughs> mold is another thing. And I wonder if, there's, if you've noticed other regional variations due to sort of yeah. Odd, odd things like well, exogenous Braz factors like that. Brazil has this historical, uh, you know, we only learned about espresso in the last 15 years, right? We all did this cloth filtering process for coffee. Uh, but unlike the, the filtered drip coffee we have around uh, here, it's very fine ground. So it, that, that, and you know, and my family has a book. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a, a particular flavor called Rio. Which is, is that what I was thinking of? Yeah. and it's something that, for example, in the in the Arab countries, is actually very prized in coffee. Uh, but you know, in the cupping competition, if you uh, would identify Rio in in the cup, the, it would be eliminated. So you know, they, a, a lot of these things are are, are subjective. Uh, but Brazil is such a huge country, and, and the farms are are so large. I mean, we went to a farm that was, you know, produced more coffee the entire than the entire country of Bolivia, okay, which is substantial. Um, and it's grown in relatively low altitudes compared to a lot of the other places, so the flavors tend to be sweeter, more chocolatey, caramely things, and so it provides a good, a good base for a lot of espressos. You'll see a lot of espressos that have Brazil in them with a few other things. The taste for roasting, I guess, lighter roasts, right, in Brazil? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do coffee growers generally like coffee? That's changing. So I actually, if, if you go to the, to the what I would call the, the leading coffee uh, growers, they're actually learning cupping and learning uh, barista uh, activities. And they're, it's actually really interesting to see. So when I went to Central America, 
the you know the, the, the coffee grower that I was visiting, Aida Batie, she's a, a five, fifth generation coffee grower. She just got this highfalutin espresso machine, and she was and she got a certificate from the you know Barista Association of America that she's a certified barista. So that it's actually really interesting to see that the uh, the producers and the, the baristas are coming together. In fact, this year was the first time that a, um, a barista from a producing country won the championship from El Salvador. It was, it was a mind-boggling presentation I mean, to the extent that you can be. I, I was... I was <laughs> but you can go and see it on the web. So it's, uh, it's, it's really... These people do amazing things. So th this guy, for example, he, he had his uh, coffee roasted in uh, England. Okay, by, by some highfalutin roaster. And he wanted to, to figure out how many days since the roast date would be the best day to serve the coffee. And furthermore, the competition was in, in Bogota, Colombia, which is in high altitude, and that changes the, the, you know, the way the crema acts and, and stuff like that. And so what he did was he took a bunch of coffees that he got from the roaster, he went up to a high mountain in, in El Salvador, and he basically, you know, prepared the coffee every day until he figured out that two weeks from the day of roasting is was the right time for this particular bean. And so he went to Colombia and he explained all this and he, like, he won the championship. <laughs> <laughs> it was just amazing. How do you like the roaster coffee these days? I'm waiting for your recipe, man. I'm, uh, I like it, uh, I like it uh, light. light. But it's actually it's harder to roast light. Right? It is. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's more brittle. So I'm waiting for the. We have the same. Uh, Louise and I have the same roasting uh, machine. So I've I've gone through. You know, I I bought a better espresso machine. I bought a roaster. So now I almost the entire chain of coffee production is, is in my home. Except I don't grow the coffee. Though Hector a few years ago got a bought us a plant, a coffee plant on the internet. We had it in our office. It was it was blossoming and doing really well. It takes about three or four years until it starts producing fruit. But then he went to Colombia for two weeks for Christmas and it died. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we tried, the water we gave it was not the right water. You know? uh, I have one final question. If you have to pick between a place that has a mediocre coffee, but sort of good atmosphere and culture and the other way around, a great coffee and sort of a nasty place, uh, so the, the great coffee is not in, in any nasty places. I mean, I enjoy Oslo, I enjoy... London actually has great cafes and Melbourne is not a nasty place. I, personally, I would sit in Tel Aviv. But that's, that's obviously because of that particular... Yeah. I would not... Uh, I don't think I could survive in Paris anymore. There are a few good cafes uh, uh, emerging in Paris. It, it, once you start getting into the coffee world, it's actually your life becomes harder because you can't, you just can't walk into every cafe and have coffee. Like, you know, it's, uh, so, and that's why the AeroPress is getting popular because people who care about their coffee, they bring their, their hand, hand grinders, their own beans, their AeroPress, and, and that's how they survive uh, those trips. And so the coffee culture, besides complementary environment culture, there is another complementary culture which is culture of bakery, right? Like La Brioche, Croissant, which are very different from different countries. So from your experience, which one is the most interesting and the most different, uh, most So where? Uh, like culture of this bakery to, for coffee. Uh, so a lot of times a good bakery uh, culture is, you know, makes up for bad coffee. So that's, that's why Paris exists. That's, uh, you know, in Vienna, you can go to places where, uh, the coffee is not great, but the pastries are really, are really good. Um, I found, for example, Melbourne have you know really nice uh, food in cafes. Um, you know, there's there's there are certain places where you really find some reasonable food, uh, and you can sit there for for longer. Um, London, again, the, the, all the nice cafes in London are actually Australians and Kiwis who move to to London to open cafes and teach the Brits uh, what to do. Um, but then, you know, like in the U.S., the great cafes don't actually have food. They might have a, a stone. Uh, food. You're the envy of every Googler. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll